Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. On Saturday, 23rd of November 2013, ten children were shot dead in the United States. They were from every corner of the country, from the ghettos, but also from the suburbs and more rural areas. They were all boys, but of several different races, many different backgrounds. None of the deaths made the national news, because this day and these deaths were nothing special. It was just another day in the death of America. Distilling research, insight, compassion and indignation into ten chapters of clear-headed yet powerful prose, Gary Young tells us a story of that day and of those lives so easily, so casually disposed of. Ten portraits of ten individuals which together form, as the, econo as the economist put it, a sharp portrait of America painted in blood. Gary Young is an award-winning journalist for The Guardian and The Nation magazine. He was posted to the US for The Guardian for 12 years before returning to the UK in 2015 to become The Guardian's editor-at-large. He's, become, he's been awarded the James Cameron Award for the combined moral vision and professional integrity of his coverage of the Obama campaign, and in 2015 he won the David Nyan Prize for political journalism. As well as Another Day in the Death of America, Gary Young is the author of The Speech, Who Are We, Stranger in a Strange Land, and No Place Like Home. Another Day in the Death of America was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize, the Jalak Prize, the CWA Gold Dagger for Nonfiction, and the Bread and Roses Award. The Observer called Another Day in the Death of America a heartbreaking, shattering and searing indictment of the effects of the lack of gun control. Irvin Welsh said it was a righteous challenge to the big insanities of American society, gun ubiquity, racism, poverty and the supine and bland media which taboos genuine discourse on them, while Naomi Klein simply called it Gary Young's masterwork. Please join me in welcoming him to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you, Gary, for joining us tonight. Um, I guess maybe the, the place I'd like to start is the, the origins of the project, in mm. fact, uh, because this is quite um, <coughs> an unusual approach to, to the, the gun control debate or, the, or to the story of, mm. of guns in the United States. It's not a particularly outwardly polemical book. You don't, you don't set off with a thesis and then, uh, and then set out to prove it, but you set out to tell, as I said in the introduction, ten stories. Why... Did you take this approach? Um, yeah, I wish I could say it was my idea. Mm -hmm. um, it was... Um, I was commissioned to do a version of this in 2007 for The Guardian magazine. And while doing it, I thought this, this could be a book. This should be a book. Um, the stories were very compelling and, um, uh, and it shocked me the degree to which some of the stories got no coverage. And there was one in particular, when I did it that time, there was a boy called Brandon Martel Moore who was shot in Detroit. <clears throat> and he wasn't even named. There were two papers in Detroit at the time. He wasn't named. It took me ages to find out his name. And then I found out what happened to him, which is that he got into a store with his cousins and his uncle. The store said, you can only... <coughs> you have to be accompanied by an adult. The kids wanted to play on the computer games. So the uncle said, OK, I'll go and get the stuff and then I'll come get you. While the uncle was off, they got kicked out of the store and they got into a tussle with the security guard. Uh, one of Brandon's, particularly one of Brandon's brothers. Anyway, his gun fell out and they saw his gun and they ran and the security guard got down and just started shooting and he shot Brandon in the back and killed him. That would do for me, for that, you know, that's a story. But um, then it turned out that that security guard was an off-duty cop. And then it turned out that that off-duty cop had killed someone in a drunk driving accident. And that that same off-duty cop had shot his wife. And that he'd shot a neighbour and killed him. And it wasn't news. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was so not news that they didn't even mention Brandon's name in the piece. And... You see stories like that, and that was during that initial thing, and you think, well, how many other stories are like that? This just happens to be a day that I've chosen, and the kid that i found. And, um, and so when, uh, in 2013, um, I got a request from a publisher saying, through my agent, saying, does Gary have a gun book in him? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, this, this. Mm -hmm. And it's such a simple idea that... She kind of got back to me almost immediately and just said, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, those those were the origins. But the desire in it is really... Y you're right, it doesn't set out with a polemical mission, 
but there's a mission to kind of make these statistics human, mm-hmm. which, without being polemical, becomes a mission in itself, really. I think that it, it definitely does that. I mean, there's that sense of... Be- if you were to talk in sort of the, the sheer numbers, um, I mean, if, it, if we have... It's about seven a day, so mm. that would mean sort of about... 2,000, two, two yeah. yeah. Um, suddenly these numbers start to be, in a way, difficult to, to process mm. and sort of not, not exactly meaningless, but it's, it's hard for us to understand mm. what that is, how that compares to perhaps other countries. Or, but when you isolate a particular day and you take those 10 stories and you tell that stories, in a way, in focusing in on specific stories, it tends to give it more weight in some way. Yeah, that, well, that's definitely what I was trying to do, was to... <clears throat> was to, um, first of all, make these children human. Mm -hmm. Secondly, excavate their stories from... Mm -hmm. because they were buried in plain sight, really. It's not like there was any major work I had to do in order to find out that these kids had died, and yet most of them get barely 80 words in the local Mm -hmm. press, and then that's it. Maybe 20 seconds on the news. Maybe. And um, <clears throat> and to kind of I want to make too bold a claim for it, but there's this journalistic adage that you're taught at journalism school. It's, just, it's not that complicated, but that you know, <clears throat> when a dog bites a man, that's not a story. When a man bites a dog, it's a story. And sooner or later with these things, you have to ask yourself, well, who owns these dogs? Mm -hmm. And why do they keep biting people? And why do the same people keep getting bitten? Which is a different way of saying that just because you become used to something doesn't mean it's normal Mm -hmm. and doesn't mean it's right. And that here was something that felt that uh, America become inured to, Mm -hmm. um, that I felt I could... Um, um, kind of turned on its head in that mm-hmm. saying, said, look, how, how normal can this be, really? Look at these kids mm-hmm. who, you know. I, I would like to you know, spend a little bit of time later actually talking specifically about the media coverage that these deaths mm. get or don't get and, and, the, and the sort of the language uh, uh, the media tends to, to use to talk about them. But just concerning the, the project itself to begin with, the I'd like to talk a little bit about the practicalities of um, investigating it. Not only, obviously, uncovering the information, but also uh, your position as a Brit in America as well. Did you um, did you anticipate that provoking any resistance, or conversely, that making it easier as us maybe as an outsider to to get access to these families and tell these stories? I think <clears throat> I I just imagine that. I kept thinking, if my child had been shot dead, would I want to talk to anyone? Mm-hmm. What would persuade me to talk to them or not? And that um, I thought it depended on the nature of the approach. And that I, being British, and frankly being black and British, mm-hmm. just made me odd. Mm-hmm. You know, very odd. And therefore, um, the approach when it came would come out of the blue and and also because nobody else had really been interested in the fact that their kid had died Mm. and so just an approach from anybody regardless of where they're from would be like they weren't suspicious i mean actually quite often they were really glad their Mm. kid had been removed from the planet nobody seemed to care beyond their immediate family and suddenly somebody shows up uh usually with a letter um um, and says, um, I'd like to know more about your child. Uh, and, um, but there's everything odd about that before you get to me being British. Uh, to be honest, I think that in the approaches, I don't know that being British had a big impact. I think that when I met them, being black had an impact in terms of that they were less likely the African Americans, and seven of the kids on that day were African American of the ten who were killed. The African Americans were less likely to feel like it was just an anthropological exercise, mm-hmm. and that they were it was you know one more person kind mm-hmm. of peering at them through the, through um, uh, through a glass window. Mm-hmm. Um, I think before we we go on to talk about the specific cases and some of the the issues they raised. Um, I think it'd be good to kind of to set the to sort of the 
gun culture in in context as mm. well because i think and we were just talking about this a moment ago as i think as a european going to the united states i mean we we tend i think because of you know the cultural exchange over the last hundred mm. however many years to think to assume a certain proximity to a certain similarities between uh Euro european culture british french and <coughs> and american mm. and yet at least in my experience i have had this when you go to american cities and you suddenly realize that there are just there's this kind of abundance of firearms whether concealed or or otherwise and it just it's it leads to this almost sense of kind of cognitive dissonance i find yeah i mean it was the, there were two things that i struggled to explain to a non-american audience mm -hmm. while i covered america for 12 years the first was healthcare mm -hmm. why wouldn't they want it and the second was guns why would they want them and um uh and i each time these things and th there is a there is an illusion mm -hmm. that um because we are so familiar with american culture tv and so on uh w with a form of american culture that which is packaged for us mm -hmm. <clears throat> that it is way that it seems m way for f more familiar than than it is and because we maybe you know we we watch john oliver on youtube and we you know we may read the new york times online and there's something about the surround sound mm -hmm. that you really need to get it. And so I was always shocked whenever I was back in Britain when one of these incidents like Las Vegas would occur mm -hmm. and people would say, surely now there'll be gun control. Mm -hmm. And you think, no, mm -hmm. no, that's... And you didn't have to be there long mm -hmm. <clears throat> because these things were so common. Yeah to realize that it didn't look like anything obvious was going to mm -hmm. kind of push the dial and um and that's when you kind of grasp just how foreign a country it is so just just w one example um in Ju i covered the election from a town called muncie indiana i was there for a month and one night i went out with um, the local republicans for a steak dinner and the guy sitting opposite me, um, <clears throat> who was trolling me, really, he, um, he, and he said, uh, what's it like to live in London at the moment where your Muslims have elected that mayor and you've got all that gun control? Mm. And I was like, Jesus, <laughs> where do I start here? And I said, well, the Muslims didn't elect a mayor. London elected a Muslim mayor, so... You know, I'm sure a lot of Muslims did vote for him, but there aren't enough Muslims to elect a mayor in London. And I said, we don't really talk about gun control much. You know, same reason we don't talk about polar bear control, because we haven't got many <laughs> polar bears, we haven't got many guns. It's not, doesn't feel like an urgent thing. <clears throat> and then the local leader of the Republican Party leaned over, like, to help me. Like, you know, he doesn't take sugar kind of thing. Yeah. And so he leant, he leant over when I said about the gun control. We don't really talk about it that much. And he said... They don't have freedom. They don't. <laughs> they don't understand freedom, and it was obvious to everybody else, mm. apart from me, what that was. I mean, and it was obvious because I lived there long enough. Which is like, yeah, they live under tyranny. Uh -huh. They don't. They don't get it. They uh -huh. don't. They don't. You know, we're free people, mm -hmm. and as free people, we can carry a gun. Mm -hmm. But they are subject people, and they don't really understand what it is to be free because the freedom and the gun are as one. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not saying he's representative of all Americans, but the fact that someone could say something so odd mm -hmm. and that it can be understood as, you know, kind mm -hmm. of so obvious is an indication of just how foreign mm -hmm. um, America is on that subject. And I think of how deeply embedded uh in maybe the american psyche this this concept of the, the or perhaps this connection between uh the pos uh, possession of guns and uh freedom is well yeah i mean <clears throat> one of the things that shocked me doing the book was that i would ask the open question to every single family what do you think this is about what's going on here they lost their kid the kid had been shot not a single one mentions guns mm -hmm. it just doesn't come up when you ask the more leading question, what do you think of guns? Uh, mostly they'll say, well, it's crazy. It's crazy that it's so easy to get guns. Mm -hmm. But I figured 
my conclusion after a while of them not saying guns was it's a bit like traffic if your kid was run over you might argue we should have a traffic light there or a stop sign or we should bring down the speed limit mm -hmm. but you're not going to say we should get rid of traffic mm -hmm. because well, it was traffic it's mm -hmm. going to be there you know and you, you have to navigate you have to deal with it you have to teach your children mm -hmm. how to deal with it and that they understood guns in the same way that i would understand traffic it's mm -hmm. just like well what is there to say why waste emotional energy on something that's not mm -hmm. going anywhere but it's also true that the gun and this is one of the things one of the key things that i think isn't understood very much outside of america and isn't openly kind of discussed even in america really is that it it is it taps into some of the core myths mm -hmm. of a certain notion of what it means to be an american so if you go to the nra convention and you, you as i've been to a couple now and i would say look i'm british i don't get it explain it to me and they almost always say the same thing. Are you married? Yes. Do you, do you have children? Yes. And then they're off to the races. Imagine somebody broke into your house and they were going to rape your wife and they were going to kill your kids and they were going to steal everything you've worked for. What are you going to do? Swing a bam? Are you going to call the police and wait for the police to come and pick up your body? Or are you going to stop and fight? Mm -hmm. And in there, there is an appeal to masculinity, mm -hmm. to homestead, to small government, to rugged individualism, to might is right, mm -hmm. to a kind of range of things. And it's all nonsense. Mm -hmm. Most people who are shot dead in America kill themselves. After that, you're most likely to be shot by people you know. Mm -hmm. So you should say, are you married? Yes. Well, watch out for your wife, because she's probably going <laughs> to shoot you dead. But they, but they don't want to say that. So they c conjure a kind of um, uh, a stranger, uh, you know, a, a, a fear scenario. And those myths are much stronger, even if they're flawed, mm -hmm. than the facts, even if they're right. Mm -hmm. And and that's why something like Las Vegas, long after the memory of the pictures have faded, those myths mm -hmm. kind of endure. Yeah. And so the gun rights people are driven, are motivated by something mm -hmm. bigger than just a single mm -hmm. thing. It's an entire kind of construction of what it means mm -hmm. to be American. When you're writing about the um, NRA con uh, convention, you, at the moment you say the... the, the relationship of the, the men there to their guns is uh, romantic, almost sexual mm. in nature. Um, and at another moment when you're writing about um, uh, the, uh, the child Tyler Dunn, who, mm. um, who was killed, you talk about this, um, the kind of the lure of firearms, the kind of, yeah, the sort of the appeal of, the, of the, the, the object in some way sort of trumps the warnings about its danger and the possible harm you can do with it. Um, and when I was reading that, the, I, it suddenly occurred to me that I have never held a gun, never fired a gun, like in any sort of controlled mm. situation. And I was just wondering, have you, and uh, did you kind of, have you come in researching this book to sort of understand the fetishization of that object, of why it holds so much power for, for men or for certain types of men? I mean, only in a way that is really uncharitable mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore you know, not my best self, really, uh -huh. but that it feels like uh, it's compensation for an inadequacy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a desire for a sense of feeling powerful mm -hmm. that could come from your sense of self, mm -hmm. but, you know, a shortcut would be a lethal weapon, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and it's a very, to me, very kind of hollow, kind of power but nonetheless there it is um so so there's that for men and it is really it's quite icky the kind of you know they stroke them and they're kind of you know they're looking at them and they're kind of uh, you know they fondle them really i mean it is it's not healthy <laughs> and then for for kids and it, this relates because it is mostly boys there is this, and that I understand more. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's some guns in that closet. Don't touch them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just fucking catnip to yeah. a kid, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I've got a kid. Mm -hmm. The best way to make sure he's going to touch something is to say, 
don't touch it. <laughs> and um, uh, so, and kids do stupid stuff, mm -hmm. and they they don't understand the consequences fully of what they're mm -hmm. doing. And I'm really keen on. I've got a four year old and a ten year old. I'm very keen on the issue of personal responsibility, but. It's also true with children that we have collective responsibility for children, which is why we have social services and child courts, and there's a knowledge that they are not fully mature. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's just unreasonable to expect them to grasp, and in the case of Tyler Dunn, who is shot dead by his friend at a sleepover during, during this day, the dad has left... He, the dad cannot even remember how many guns he's got, but he's left four of them out, and some of them are loaded. And um, uh, Brandon, um, his son, the dad goes away, goes out. Brandon, his son, who's like 13, um, is showing Dylan the gun. It's not exactly clear what happens, mm -hmm. but Dylan ends up literally with his head blown off. And... Um, um, and when, when Brandon calls the police and they say, how are you? And he says, I'm fine, except that I just shot my friend dead. Mm. And you can kind of feel this kind of 13-year-old just thinking, what the hell's just happened? Mm. And there, there's another case in the book of, um, uh, uh, of accidental shooting. That's really a negligent shooting because the father left them out. But there's an accidental shooting with two kids in Houston. And... The, the girl, Camilla, who does it, she kills her best friend. The next day on Facebook, she says, you know, why does this shit keep happening to me? Mm -hmm. And it's both, like, the extreme narcissism of a teenager and this kid struggling with, like, you know, what the hell just happened? And... Um, uh, and so particularly with kids, that it, I do understand with mm -hmm. kids... The irresistibility is partly that it's taboo, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to do it, and it's partly a, a really a kind of lack of understanding about what the consequences of of breaching that mm -hmm. is. It's just one more thing you're not allowed to do. There's no connection between that and mortality. And that becomes particularly acute if you play an awful lot of video games where people die mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then everybody goes out for a pizza. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the kids themselves. Um, and first of all, um, why you specifically decided to write a book about kids rather than about uh, gun deaths in general? I guess it was there was partly the collective responsibility thing that children are a special category, a protected category almost, and um, and that it doesn't obviate the question of personal responsibility, but it mitigates it. Children that have personal responsibility within a framework of them being children. Um, so there was that. Secondly, it does, um, to be crude, it provides a manageable number. Mm -hmm. For If I was doing adults, that would be 81 people in a day. Because um, there's 88, roughly 88, 90 Americans are shot dead each day. Um, uh, so th th those were the main reasons that... Um, um, yeah, that I chose uh, children. And when you um, when when you started the research, um, when when you started sort of uh, tracking down uh, the names first of all, and then finding out about their lives, um, again, did you have any uh, any uh, any sort of suspicion of, for example, the uh, what the race of the kids would be, of what particular areas of the United States? Uh, they, the the deaths might be concentrated in, and were those confirmed or confounded? I guess a significant number of them would be black. Mm -hmm. uh, on an average day, of the seven kids who were shot dead, three are black, three are white, one's Latino. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't doing suicides, and two of the seven are suicides on average, and suicides skew white. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I thought there would be more in the big cities. Um, there were really very few in, in uh, big cities. I think Chicago, Houston, Dallas, Charlotte, mm -hmm. and Newark. Um, 
I imagine more. Um, um, in the previous one that I'd done, there was a once a week a toddler mm-hmm. shoots somebody. Might be themselves, or it might be an adult. Um, I thought that that might might happen. I assumed that there would might be at least one girl, which there wasn't. Um, and um, yeah, I I was fairly certain that one would be in Chicago. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was one of the chilling things. Was thinking, well, I think what, I lived in Chicago at the time, and I thought, well, one of these kids is going to be in Chicago, and they're basically going to be around here. Mm-hmm. And there is something spooky about the dependability of that statistic. That that is a. There are some statistics that kind of average out. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is this statistic is is true to its word, mm-hmm. and so you can sit in a macabre fashion, and I don't mean this in the, even remotely cynically. You can sit and wait for the children to die. You can say, "Well, this is Saturday. I'll wait and see." Well, you don't know where they're going to die, but you know they're going to die. Um, uh, so, and I was quite determined that I would take them as I found them. So. Um, I wasn't going to say mm, there's too many gang ones mm-hmm. or there's too many this, there's too many that or you know I'll wait for a toddler shooting or that I was going to take them as I found them and and I was also determined which was much more which was also very challenging that they would I would document them in the order either that they died or that they fell but that there would be that the day would choose the victims and it would construct the book. And all, what was left for me to do was uh, to find the stories. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't game it to manipulate the reader. Mm-hmm. And that was challenging because the first death is really hard. Mm-hmm. It's the hardest one. He's, a, he's the youngest kid. It's, it's a, I mean, they're all senseless, but it's a kind of brutal, senseless, awful... And generally speaking, you read that, and people, a, a number of people have said, yeah, I read that, and then I put it down, and I didn't touch the book for another ten mm-hmm. days. It was just kind of, you know, it was, it was just too heavy. Mm-hmm. And that was um, the, a, a murder committed by, um, by a man who was referred to um, as being in the amok yeah. state. Mm. Um, and, and I think, uh, if from a kind of sociological perspective, that... Um, that seemed that seemed very very telling in a way because um, and I mean you, you just do, or you use a definition by for, uh, from Kellner or talking about people uh, people I think it was in Papua New Guinea mm. uh, who who was talking to somebody who had sort of had uh, run amok so to speak and um, they said that my life has been reduced to nothing by an intolerable insult mm. and this sort of sense of having yeah having been gravely insulted by either by somebody or by society and having nothing left to lose and essentially wanting to 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 bring about your your own downfall by um by committing this uh sort of atrocious act it sort of it highlights in a very uh very sort of intense way how so so many of the the cases in this book are connected in some way to to poverty yeah. and to exclusion yeah and to masculinity i mean it is this interesting thing that happens when something like Vegas happens or something like that. People talk about everything apart from masculinity. And it's also true when we talk about terror attacks that um, they often concentrate on the perpetrators being Muslim, but they always forget the other thing, which is that they're generally men. And that... um, So what happens with um, Jaden Dixon, who's the first kid to fall, is um, basically he answers the door. That's what he does. Uh, he uh, he's nine years old. His mum has a rule: Jaden, if you're up all the way up and ready, you can you know do what you want. You can watch Duck Dynasty, which he used to like. You can watch Cars. You can play Minecraft. But you have to have your socks on, your shoes on, ready to walk out the door. So Jaden is up and he's ready, and he's fantasising about maybe pitching uh, in his baseball team. And there's a knock at the door. They think it's the girls from down the road. Um. Uh, Nicole, his mum, says, you know, will somebody get that? Jaden jumps up and he answers the door as a kid might 
as though he's going to jump out and say boo. So he's kind of hiding behind the door. So he, whoever's standing at the door can't see him. And then nobody walks in. And so Jaden pokes his head round and bang, he's shot straight in the head. And it's his mum's ex partner and the father of Jaden's older brother, Danny Thornton. And it turns. Well, no, we knew, we, they knew this at the time. That Danny had told his son, I'm not going to be a 50-year-old man with no job living in my car. Um, I'd rather take you all out. And uh, he, t he tells this to his son, and his son doesn't tell his mum for a while because he just thinks, well, who'd do that? And then he tells his mum, and his mum says, no, he will do it. He's got a list. He really, he's literally got a list. And... Um, yeah, and he does it, and then he um, he he goes on a rampage and he shoots an ex-partner but doesn't kill her, and then he's eventually shot dead in a shootout with the cops in a Walmart car park, and um, well, there are a couple of things going on there. First, there's the issue of masculinity and of poverty of exclude of of a man who is less than, and and it comes back to that issue of like the the lure of the gun like so this is a way he has power you know who's going to challenge that power um and there's also i was very determined in the book the where there were themes i would pursue them mm -hmm. so in newark i talk about deindustrialization and the lack of jobs and the lack of jobs what that does to a community that could lead to things like shootings or the way the media treat people or the fact that these kids are adolescents and adolescents are actually hardwired to do crazy things. Um, um, but where there weren't themes, I didn't pursue them because I, I didn't want to shoehorn mm -hmm. this stuff in. And it's pretty clear to me that Danny Thornton had some kind of mental health problem. Um, but I can't diagnose him and I couldn't find people who knew him and so I had to leave it I could get as far as the m run amok mm -hmm. and the masculinity of it without knowing him just from the self-evident depiction of others mm -hmm. uh, and then just decided to leave it there and certainly um, more broadly speaking uh, I mean you said you were you were expecting um, the victims to be disproportionately black mm. and they were um, and at the moment, you you say quite clearly, America is racist, mm. which you then qualify by saying, which doesn't mean that all Americans are racist, but the society, the judiciary, the economy, the, the whole sort of social fabric, mm. is um, is set up in in a racist in a racist mm. way, and as a result, and it's sort of it's almost like a, uh, a sort of like a chemical. A, equation in a way mm. it's sort of you know race uh you know uh, racism exclusion deprivation availability of guns poverty yeah i mean it, america has for the most part got a lot of what the rest of the western world has got it's got racism and exclusion and poverty and inequality and you know it's not unique in having those things and i mean they're uniquely configured but that's true for everywhere but it's on top of that huge pile of tinder mm -hmm. you put the easy accessibility of lethal weapons that's in you know in no other country would this western country would this book be possible and um i did think long and hard before that sentence america is racist and then I do go on to qualify a bit, but it stands by itself, and I don't withdraw from it. But I just thought, well, this is just self-evidently true, and it would just be it would just be a lie not to talk about that, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean um, um, that other places aren't racist, or that's all America is. But life expectancy for a black man in Washington, D.C., is lower than black ma uh, male life expectancy on the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. You can't understand that without understanding racism. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a slave state for 200 years, an apartheid state for 100 years, and it's only been a non-racial democracy for 50 years. So, 
the idea of racial equality is relatively new. Now, that's not unique to America. That's actually true for Britain, in a way, and France, and how kind of different countries administered areas that they controlled, even if it wasn't on, on, you know, at home on that land. But, you know, if my son wants to know about um, segregation, he can just ask his granddad, who was raised under segregation in the South, um, and he's African American. And um, America is very good at reinventing itself in a range of ways. And it's one of the things actually I really like about it the, the way it, and Americans as well, can reimagine themselves and things, you know, in a, in a very kind of creative way. But that also means that quite often they just travel light from history and it's like you try and raise the issue of segregation it's just like well what you know why are you bringing up old stuff you know and until it comes to like dealing with a confederate statue and then it's like leave all my old stuff where it is so um uh there is it's both it's kind of it's worst kept secret in a way and it it um there's a way in which it's so blatantly clear and yet so brazenly denied that it's just worth just making a statement and then moving on. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And you also address in the book how a lot of the um, debate or the conversation around uh, particularly the high, um, the high levels of death of deaths for African American children um, is founded on myths and essentially racist myths. So, uh, or for example, when people talk about black on black crime you say mm. well yeah that's a nonsense term because more or less you know as it's quite a segregated society more or less all criminality is with, segregated. Yeah, yeah yeah segregated or for example the the myth about uh, black men often abandoning their mm. children and you know you, you sort of demonstrate with kind of quite uh clear quite cold statistics how that isn't isn't the case in the way that people uh people often build it up I mean, did you find you sort of when you were you were talking to people and when you were researching the book that these things were things that kept coming up and the, were you able to kind of dissuade people of them or? I, uh, I mean generally speaking i didn't try i just i was just letting people speak and then um and then i might prod them why do you think that where's that coming from but i wouldn't say well that's not true mm -hmm. um i mean two things were particularly interesting uh one was the way in which uh, parenting would come up mm -hmm. and um, because people didn't mention guns that was the next thing that people would mention which I figure is because parenting is something you can control you can say that person should do this and you might be right or you might not be right but that could happen whereas getting rid of guns probably isn't going to happen and um, um, and there was this assumption and it was m most keenly in the Samuel Brightman story in Dallas, where immediately after a very short article about Samuel's death, um, he was walking down the road at 11.30 and he was shot. And that's pretty much all it says, he was shot. He was walking with a friend at 11.30 in this part of Dallas, which is a black poor part of Dallas, and he was shot dead. And one of the first comments afterwards was, well, I don't want to blame the victim, and then of course she goes on to blame the victim, but, you know, parents need to know where their children are, and they need to be more rigorous. I wouldn't let my kids out at that time, and blah, blah, blah. And it's full of these assumptions about who has raised Samuel. And then you find his mum, and then you find out what he was doing that night, and that uh, his friend Denzel had come over, it was a Saturday night, he'd come over because he was going to take his granny to church the next morning. Um, so he was in the area, so they invited him round. They played Uno, they drank cocoa, they watched We're the Millers. The worst thing that, that Samuel did that night was cheat at Uno. And then when Denzel said he had to go home, Samuel said, I'll walk you home. Six minutes walk. And he was shot while he was walking. His mum knew where he was, she just couldn't save him. And, um, but what you get from this comment underneath is both well the parents must be negligent but also 
I'm a bloody genius. Mm-hmm. I keep my kids alive. Why can't you? And it's like, well, you keep your kids alive because you probably live in a kind of white, fairly wealthy area which, which is not policed like an occupied territory, where the schools are fine, where you have the kind of time to drive your kids from one thing to another, and where, the, where if someone gets killed, the issue's reported, and therefore politicians will act, and therefore it will be policed in a kind of certain way. It's not your genius that's making this happen. It's, uh, it's, there's obviously systemic reasons why these things happen here. And either you think, well, it's not happening to me because I'm just brilliant, or um, it's happening to these people because they have a deficient culture, because on some level they are bringing this death on themselves. So it was that. But then the second thing, and you alluded to the statistics about black parenting, uh, black fatherhood, was the degree to which people will believe scripts against themselves. So the degree to which you'll, you'll speak to the mother of a child who's been killed, uh, and she's got two kids. One's in prison, one's been killed. She had her first kid when she was 14, she had her second kid when she was 17. And you ask her, what do you think's going on that, you know, your kid would be shot? And she says, it's the parents. You know, the bad parents, and they don't love their kids the way they should, and you're thinking, you know, don't you? I didn't say this to her, but that's what people would be saying about you. That's exactly what people would be saying about you. And you think, well, why do people believe things? Or they they will say, you know, nowadays it's terrible, babies having babies, teenage pregnancy. In my day, people would always evoke the ancient art of pugilism, that in my day people used to just do get out with these, you know. And then you look at the stats, and it's actually in your day, more people were killed, because most of these kids' parents grew up during the crack epidemic. More people were killed, and actually teenage pregnancy is going down. And what you realise is that these scripts can be repeated so often that people will believe them against it against themselves and that sounds like an account of false consciousness then what I discovered when looking at that um, report about black fatherhood which was a government report which showed that while African American men are less likely to live with their partners than uh, any other race they were more likely to read to their children to bathe their children to help their children with their homework and a range of things Now, this, when I read this I just thought well that can't be true so, you know, I was, you know, went back to the original source and then looked for people contradicting it. And, and after a little while, I was like, what are you doing? You are a black parent. You, do, you are a black father. You do all of these things. And yet somehow, because that script is out there, you, um, you can't believe it, even when you've been presented with the fact and you've checked it out. You're looking for a way not to believe this. And... Um, um, yeah, I think that people um, go with the scripts that are available, which is why sometimes when people say, oh, you're preaching to the choir, well, sometimes choir needs a song to sing. And I think that's the, the, the last thing I, I'd like to talk to you about. I mean, I, I could go on all evening, but I suspect there are questions from the audience. Uh, but I did say earlier we would speak about the media, and I think what you've just said has sort of led us quite nicely onto that, like where these, these scripts come from. Um, now, you mentioned earlier, and you also talk about it in the book, the, the, the sort of the dynamics of of news reporting and why certain things get reported and why certain mm. things don't and the sort of in a way there's something unsurprising and perhaps quite natural about the fact that if something occurs repeatedly it's not going to always be the the first mm. the first headline um on a page but there's also the um the question and um of of who is writing the news and mm. who is framing the agenda and and at one moment uh, you say those who frame the news agenda are not those most likely to be affected by by gun crime by this um, this the, the, by the, what's going on? Do you think this is changing? Do you think there are sort of moves afoot to sort of uh, to bring more voices and more experience into uh, media, perhaps, or perhaps it's it's happening through through new media, through online media? I don't. Um, if it is happening, it's happening so slowly that, um, you know, it's kind of painful, really. Um, Yeah, if you look at who's in a newsroom now, I think this would both be true in America and in Britain. It's more diverse in a range of ways that 
than it would have been 30 years ago. It's also less, di it's also as monocultural mm -hmm. in one particular way, which is class. Mm -hmm. And so it can be that you have lots of different quite well-off people, all of whom are looking from the outside in. Mm -hmm. And um, it struck me when I was in, uh, I did a, a three-month fellowship at the Washington Post and um, a, a quite a few African American journalists, and there were, there were, at that time, the number of black journalists at the Guardian you could meet in a phone box. I mean, it just wasn't that many of us. But it, at the Washington Post, there were quite a lot, and they were quite um, uh, organised. And quite a few of them kind of showed me a map of DC, and then just coloured a big chunk of it in and said, "Don't go there. Mm -hmm. Just don't go there." And they were places where black people lived. And it was the first time in my life that black people had told me not to go somewhere where black people lived. And uh, and it wasn't like it was crazy advice. They were dangerous places. But it spoke to a class differential that meant that they would still be... While they may have, almost certainly would have more connections to people in those areas than many of the white journalists, they weren't the areas that they occupied. And so, um, uh, and so it matters having more women, more black folk, more gay folk or trans folk or whatever. It matters having all of those. But the more that societies become unequal, the more you just get different kinds of people writing about one kind of people, which is poor people, who may also be of different kinds of people. And I think some of that we've seen playing out, actually, with things like Brexit and um, Trump and other things, where you have a, a journalistic class which is, um, which is too far removed from actually the lived reality of large numbers of people, which isn't only journalism's fault. It's also about the growth of inequality, which makes that possible. On which note, I'm going to hand over to you. If you have a question for Gary Young, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you so everybody uh, can hear you. Who would like to kick us off? Don't be shy. Everybody agrees with me. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we'll just run the microphone. Yeah, <laughs> um, that actually goes about the racism part. Mm -hmm. um, what made you choose the cover of your book? Um, this one. Yes. Um, well, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't so much that I chose it. I mean, the way that these things work, they present you with, you know, and they say, "What do you think of that? And what do you think of this?" Um, but I do like it, and I'll explain why. Um, I asked the question, the first question I asked when I saw it was, why are they white people? And, because um, uh, I'm subtle like that. <laughs> and, and we talked about it, because it, it, they knew what they'd done, but they hadn't really thought through why they'd done it. And once we thought it through together, we thought, oh yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Which is that this is a kind of almost a caricatured image of the way that America sees itself. Um, which is uh, not all Americans, but you know the 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 meta America, which is a white wholesome kind of uh, nuclear family, and then it's splattered with this blood, and it's that notion that look here's this image that you have of America, here's this sense that you have of the country that you live in, and this is actually what it looks like deep you know deep that 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 it's a challenge to the myth of the perfect America, really. So that was, that's how we understood it once we'd, once we'd thought it through. Mm -hmm. But don't you think that you as a, uh, please don't get me wrong, but you as a black male, for instance, this book in the States right now, don't you think when people look at it, it's going to affect yourself but as the white people look at it and go, oh, so this black guy wrote it, but about the guns, but it's really making us white people look bad or something like that. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I do. Okay. So, 
I mean, first of all, it's not the cover in America because it would be it would be too in your face in America. So the one in America is just of ten bullet holes um, going across, and in the same spirit, not to you know be in any way uh, uh, arsy, but that um, I can't live my life worrying about what white people are going to think of what I do because if I do that, I'll never get up in the morning. So, so. Um, if they're going to think that, they're going to think that anyway. And um, if they're predisposed to think that, then they're probably not predisposed to um, uh, read the book. And all you can do with these things is be as honest as you can, knowing yourself as you do. I would not have suggested this cover in America, not because of the race of the people, but just because um, in... In America, it needed to be more sensitive to the fact that it's happening there, and therefore it needed to be um, a quieter, uh, more um, uh, sober, less kind of racy idea. Um, uh, and I was quite adamant about that. Um, but if I'd have thought that this was a good cover for America, th then I would have pursued it and you know, and then what happens, happens really. Thank you so much. All right, so I like the idea about giving the choir something to sing, but what did you find actually worked as a song? Like what arguments actually got through to people when you spent time in America? With regard to gun violence? Um, uh, that's just it. I'm not sure that I did find an argument. What, what I end by saying is writing this book has made me want to scream. Mm -hmm. And it's made me want to scream because let's say it takes you a week to read the book. That's 50 kids going to die. It's a dependable statistic. And you know that nothing's going to be done about it. And um, or even though all sorts of things could be done about it. And that um, um, and so when it I guess there is a very simple song that one might sing. It's just that no one <laughs> would really be listening. Um, and I use... Um, excuse me for just a second. In the... I think these things are called inscriptions, right at the beginning. The little... Um, um, I use a quote from Sven Lindqvist, uh, which sums up what I think about, you know the issue and it just says you already know enough so do I it's not knowledge we lack what's missing is the courage to understand what we know and to draw conclusions and that's what I think about it really that the solution is pretty obvious you need to get rid of guns in no other Western country would this book be possible and we there's a range of things that one could dance around that you know background checks and a range of things that would help and which I would support, but the way that other mature democracies have dealt with this problem is by uh, imposing strict gun laws. That's what Australia did after Port Arthur, Britain after Dunblane. And there isn't really a way to pass that statement. So um, I guess, um, you know, that would be my song. And in a, in a sense, the whole of the rest of the Western world is sitting here really, every time they see something like Las Vegas, they say, well, you know, deal with this. And it's, it, it is a real, whatever Americans may think about uh, uh, a limey talking smack about their gun culture, the fact is, it's a real problem for their soft power. That a lot of America, the attraction of America comes from the soft power of people loving the idea of America, of the kind of you know, the, um, the Ritz and the glamour and the basketball and the, the, all of that. And when something as dysfunctional as this keeps happening, that actually is a problem for the degree to which America can seriously, people can look at it and seriously think, really, you are the leader of the free world and this is what you tolerate. So um, um, it feels to me like everybody else gets in, apart from the polity. And to some extent, you know, Americans actually get it too, that most Americans agree that there should be more gun control. Mm -hmm. 
that the NRA wins the votes, but doesn't really win the arguments, it's almost universal, including about 93% of Republicans, believe there should be universal background checks. I mean, these things don't happen, but it's not because Americans don't want them, it's because the way that the lobbying works and the politics works, it just it never happens, but they do want it to happen. Do you have uh, plans to write a sequel? Um, and if you do, what would you focus on? And if you don't have plans and you were to develop plans later, what would you want to focus on? It's a good question. I don't have plans, and I don't even have plans about my plans, if you see what I mean. Um, I'm doing a um, series at the moment in Britain on knife crime, which is... Um, uh, certainly of a different scale but still uh, there's a lot of anxiety about knife crime there have been 28 kids this year have been killed by knives same cohort 19 and under similar challenges um, in terms of disproportionate number of black kids um, although yeah disproportionate number of black kids um, and similar clear solutions in terms of you know, provision of mental health services and youth services and a, a range of things that would really mitigate this happening. And that's been very edifying for me. I don't think I want to write a book about it, um, but I, um, I'm kind of in the process of kind of pursuing a bit more long, long form journalism as opposed to books. And I figure if if a book emerges from something that I'm doing and I think, well, you know, I just don't have the space to do this, then that would be where it would um, uh, where it would come from. But I've got two kids and, like, you know, that's my book, really, for <laughs> the next kind of four or five years, really. Okay, I think we've got time for one final question, this lady here. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, I'm American. I was in high school during Columbine. I moved to Europe 12 years ago. Um, I'm wondering if, from your research and your time in the U.S. and your time covering this topic, do you feel like it has gotten significantly worse in the last 15 or 20 years? Because I feel like it has, but I think maybe I only think that because we're not really taught about it in schools and we're not aware. Um, in terms of um, death rates, it's getting better. Yeah, so... in. Um, in 2007, when I did that first article for The Guardian, it was eight kids every day. Now it's seven kids a day. Um, uh, so, in terms of homicide rates, it's getting better. Um, but it's getting weirder. And the reason it's getting weirder is because fewer and fewer people are owning guns, and the people who do own guns are owning more and more of them. So what you have is a situation like in Vegas, where you have people individual stockpiling large numbers of um, uh, large numbers of weapons and I think the other thing that's changed uh, w which would change your perception because it's interesting these things where actually the numbers don't change or they may change in ways that you don't understand and yet your perception shifts so it's not that more black people are being killed by police actually it's just that we now know about it uh, this has been going on for years um, but we are now have the capacity to record and uh, and transmit that we didn't before. Um, and that's that. I, I remember in 2012 going to see Obama speak in Florida, and the night before, um, uh, I can't remember his name, James something went into um, the cinema in Aurora, Colorado, and shot it up while people were watching Batman Returns, and Obama said actually something very similar to what Trump said the other day. Now is not a time for politics. You know, let's all pray. Who knows what's in the evil hearts of some men. Go home, hug your kids. Um, it was during the presidential election campaign. Um, and I wrote at the time, I know I think now is exactly a time for politics. Why, like, when should we talk about it? When we're not sensitized, that's crazy. Anyhow, that was what people had done for the previous 20 years. Then he wins the election, and then Sandy Hook happens, and he says something very different, which is, we cannot keep going on like this. We have to have this conversation. And he kind of breaks the fever, really.
Uh, and that was a big change because the, the 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 script for the previous twenty years had been something else, and he had been complicit in that during his first term. He'd already won for his second term. He wasn't going. He can't stand again, and he decides that he's going to take this on. Now, the fact that they didn't get any legislation passed, one shouldn't be too surprised about. If you haven't spoken about something for twenty years, then the first time out of the gate, it's not that surprising that nothing's going to shift or not enough is going to shift. But what that did do is open up or help open up some space for a different kind of political conversation, which is why when Trump said it this time, first of all, it's Trump, so, you know, he's going to say it wrong, and, pe you know, people who aren't predisposed to like him really don't like him, so, you know, he can't, he can't win anyway. Um, but also what's changed is that in four years, actually... Now, that's not necessarily the thing to say. Actually, there are other things that you can say, and people are expecting other things to be said. And so, to that extent, there has been a shift. And um, so there is more of a space for you and I and others to be appalled by these things and for these things to make news in a certain way that they didn't before. But this is the two... Las Vegas was the 273rd mass shooting this year. There have been four since. So, um, uh, going back to the dog bites man analogy, you, you kind of... They don't report more, and um, at some stage they pick and choose. Each time you have a terrible one like this, it raises the bar for what is going to be reported. Well, that's no Las Vegas, only 20 people got shot. Um, so, um, uh, I was looking back over the articles that I had done about mass shootings because having reported there for 12 years, after a while, you're like, I don't really have anything new to say about this. It's a new city. You know, it's that Onion thing where they just publish the same story over and over again with pictures of a different city. And there were mass shootings I'd forgotten. That I'd forgotten that it happened, that I um, I had covered. So I don't think it's crazy that you would think there's uh, that there's uh, that there's more of them. I think our understanding of it has changed. Which is unfortunately all we've got time for. I think we could probably have gone on a lot longer. Um, although the evening isn't finished, we will be serving wine. Gary will be signing books. Um, so please do continue the conversation with with Gary, with each other. Um, we have plenty of copies of both the, the English edition. We also have some copies of uh, the French edition, which came out just this week, I believe. Mm. Um, and so whatever your language of choice, we, we have them um, just at the front. Um, yeah, I really, I mean, I hope it's come across. I really can't recommend this book enough. I think it's uh, not only an incredibly powerful book, but uh, um, an incredibly important book as well, and um, and I'm not just saying that as a bookseller. I say that as a person too. Um, so so yeah. So buy books, have a glass of wine, get your book signed, and please join me one more time in saying thank you to Gary. Thank you.